so good morning. My name is Carrie Harvey. Um, I'm an emergency medicine and clinical care physician at the University of Michigan. Um, I will, actually I'll pass the mic. Oh, sweet. Um, I'm Kyle McCluskey. I'm also an EM intensivist. I work at University Hospital of Cleveland. And with me, we'll go back to Stahl. Good morning, everyone. Matt Stahl. I'm the program director uh, at University Hospitals for the re emergency medicine residency, but I also get to keep a little bit of my critical care time uh, up in the cardiothoracic ICU. So uh, the three of us were the first three uh, fellows at University of Michigan in the anesthesia training program. And so uh, we've remained good friends and look forward every year to meeting up at SAEM to give this talk. So this year's rendition, uh, we're calling Triple H, hypoxic, hypotensive, and hemorrhaging. And we're going to be doing uh, a literature review of some critical care studies from the last year that would have been published outside of mainstream, mainstream EM journals and therefore may have been missed. Uh, this will be on the last slide as well, but the QR code just links to a Google Drive where we have um, all of the papers uploaded. So if you're interested, go ahead and snap that. And again, it'll be on the last slide too. And I presume you're going to read all of these papers after this talk. No, we're joking. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, we have no conflicts of interest. We do want to just emphasize that we are presenting our opinions and, of course, encourage everyone to read the literature themselves. Um, so I'm going to start us off. Help us care for our hypoxic patients. We're going to go through two studies this morning. Uh, first up is the Recovery RS trial, which was published in JAMA earlier this year. And we don't have great evidence for managing patients with moderate hypoxia. Probably the best study we have is Florelli, which you may remember it's probably about five or six years old now. And it compared BiPAP, heated high flow, and conventional oxygen in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in that study primarily due to pneumonia. And the study found decreased rates of intubation and reduced mortality in the patients who received high flow. And that study, along with the pretty safe side effect profile of high flow, I think led to a lot of people adopting that as a trial where we would offer high flow prior to immediate intubation. So um, now we, you know, fast forward several years and a pandemic later, and we have uh, lots more data in terms of treating patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure secondary to pneumonia. And so the recovery RS trial looked to see if CPAP or high flow compared to conventional oxygen therapy reduced intubation and 30 day mortality and hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID. This was a RCT of about 1,300 patients. Uh, patients were included in the study if you were admitted with COVID to a moderate care unit with hypoxic respiratory failure. They defined that as requiring an FiO2 greater than 40% and having a SAT less than 94. In reality, the patients were slightly sicker. The mean FiO2 was 60%. The mean SpO2 was 93%. Um, interestingly though, in this study, I think it makes sense because we know that healthy people can still get sick from COVID. Um, the patients weren't very comorbid. They, uh, they kind of classified people based on a fragility score and 90% of patients were either very fit, fit or managing well, which I think is different than a lot of other ICU studies. So the intervention was non-invasive ventilation. If you got CPAP, um, the mean CPAP was about 10 millimeters of mercury. If you got high flow, the mean flow rate was about 50 liters per minute. And then that was compared just to a regular um, nasal cannula oxygen. The primary outcome was a composite of intubation and 30-day mortality. So um, the uh, oxygen group, the conventional oxygen group, 45% of the time met that primary outcome. That's highlighted in yellow. When we look at the top, when we compare CPAP to conventional oxygen, there was a significant reduction in the primary outcome, about 8%, which was a number needed to treat of about 12. There are some caveats with that. Um, for people who like the fragility index, it was three patients. Um, and also this reduction was driven pretty much exclusively by decreased rates of intubation. There was no difference in mortality between the groups. When they compared the high flow group to the conventional oxygen, there was no difference, uh, which was interesting because this contradicts the evidence from the flow rally trial. There was no difference between any groups in any of the secondary outcomes. So duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU and hospital length of stay. So the authors concluded that CPAP reduced the need for intubation or death in hypoxic patients with COVID. Um, all studies have limitations. One of the bigger ones of this study was that 
it was powered for a sample size of 4,000, and I mentioned only 1,300 patients were enrolled. That's because the COVID numbers started dropping off during like the funding period for this study. So certainly that could have affected results. Um, but I think one of the things that I take from this study is that in general, patients with moderate hypoxia from COVID deserve a trial of non-invasive ventilation. And I say that because for the patients who ended up failing CPAP or high flow and getting intubated, there didn't seem to be major harms from that, which um, I just kind of infer from the fact that the mortality ICU and hospital length of stay was not different between the groups. And it's possible that we saw a difference with, excuse me, a improvement with CPAP in this study compared to the high flow in the flow rally study. Um, if we're going off that assumption of our happy hypoxics, right? Our COVID patients whose hypoxia is driven by atelectasis and therefore benefit from the positive pressure that CPAP provides uh, versus patients with, you know, stiff, stiff wet lungs that um, would probably end up failing the CPAP. So that caveat is um, to please don't just take this as a blanket statement of like never intubate your COVID patients and flog them indefinitely on CPAP. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but I think that there is a role for this. Um, another interesting study that I would love to see would be maybe um, high flow with proning compared to CPAP, for example, because the proning could help maybe with atelectasis in those patients. I would not generalize this to like all patients with hypoxic respiratory failure from any cause. Uh, one, because that doesn't make sense with this study because this was a very specific population. But also I feel like most patients are going to be uh, not happy hypoxics. I feel like that's a rarity. Um, and most patients are quite a bit mo more comorbid and have more organ failure and all of that may kind of push me to intubate a patient sooner. I'm gonna move on to the next study. This one's a little quicker. The SAVE trial, supraglottic airway versus endotracheal intubation for non-traumatic out of hospital cardiac arrest. That acronym works, right? Yeah. It does, it works yeah. very well. Um, so. Uh, we have a lot of research on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and <clears throat> this certainly adds to it. Pre-hospital providers do ABCs, intubating patients in cardiac arrest, I think has long been, you know, standard care. But I think that that in recent years has been questioned uh, in terms of do they need to be intubated or would a supraglottic airway suffice? There are several trials from the last couple years, a few in 2018 that came out that were unfortunately conflicting one favoring endotracheal intubation, two favoring supraglottic airways. So this is yet another one, uh, a prospective study asking, are patient outcomes different between SGA versus ETI, endotracheal intubation, for our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? So again, this is a cluster randomized RCT. It was about 900 patients. Uh, it occurred in a single EMS system in Taiwan. Patients were randomized bi-weekly to either get supraglottic airway or an ET tube. And the primary outcome was uh, sustained rest, which was defined as more than two hours. There were some secondary outcomes, which was pre-hospital ROS, survival, and a favorable neurologic outcome. I will cut to the chase. There were no differences in any of the um, outcomes between the two groups, uh, primary or secondary. Um, I won't get into the details, but I do feel like the cohort, like even though this was done in um, a different country, matched US data fairly well in terms of like elderly patients, most 70% got bystander CPR, it was about 15 minutes from the call to airway time. The first pass success was pretty high, about 80%. Um, and they had kind of <laughs> similarly terrible, uh, uh, favorable neurologic outcomes, about 5%. So the authors concluded that initial airway management with ETI did not result in a favorable outcome of sustained ROST when compared to SGA. Um, but I think the takeaway from this study, which adds to those uh, trials that I mentioned on the first slide, is that um, SGA is a very reasonable first choice. The, uh, it can, I think, cognitively unload a paramedic who is doing many other things in a cardiac arrest situation and allow them to focus on the things that we know do matter, which would be high quality CPR and early defibrillation. So anyone in the room who is an EMS person, uh, you, this might be enough to change your practice and protocols if you haven't already. 
Um, for everybody else, I just want to make a point that if a patient in uh, cardiac arrest arrives with a supraglottic airway, it doesn't necessarily mean that they failed intubation in the field. That may now be the first and preferred airway strategy for the medics in your system. Um, and I think it can be considered non-inferior to an endotracheal tube in terms of all the major cardiac arrest outcomes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenter, Dr. McCloskey. So we moved from airway and hypoxemia down to hypertension. <coughs> now a little bit of audience participation. Someone comes in, they're critically ill, they're sick, your nurse, APP, asks, hey, they need some fluid. Who's on team saline? All right, and who's on team balance, low health, they're like, we're gonna get plasma light if you're lucky enough to have it or not critically ill. What a, interesting, okay. So it seems that people have been moving towards a balanced solution. There's actually been a ton of research in this area over the last couple of years. Really high quality stuff. Like multi-center, international, randomized control trials looking like is saline killing people? You know, is lactated bringers really that bad? Neither of those things are actually true. But the two things that we really have been concerned with with this particular question is their mortality difference in the critically ill if you use one of these two. And then are there renal outcomes that are important to the patient? Namely, receipt of new renal replacement therapy. People, we generally do not want folks to have to be on dialysis if we can avoid it. That's also a patient safety issue. So we had four of these big trials, so the ones at the top, huge numbers, really internally robust. And for the most part, all of them said, yeah, same, same. The uh, SMART trial, which was done at Vanderbilt Cluster Nick, which is the largest tolerant of this, had a composite outcome that maybe uh, spoke that maybe could we do worse with more information. Where we're at today is um, the PLUS trial came out this past, in the past six months, and there's now an updated Bayesian meta-analysis that I'm gonna cover very briefly, trying to cover, now that we've had all, the, all these RCTs, what's the answer? It depends if you're a frequentist statistician or a Bayesian, right? If you actually look at the confidence intervals here, both of them include none. So if you were looking at that, they're the same thing. There's no difference in either mortality or receipt of new renal replacement therapy. However, when you get up to the numbers of 36,000 patients, and those confidence intervals start getting you know, fairly tight, you can make the argument that there may be a 9% reduction or a 1% like, worsening in survival using that same data. So it comes down to which statistics you want to use. This actual paper or meta-analysis is a Bayesian one that they um, come to the conclusion that lactated ringers, if you use over the basis of your career in all of the folks with critical illness, probably going to save some lives and probably will reduce you know, the need for new um, renal replacement therapy. That being said, um, we also have a lot of, like these differences are pretty minuscule. So I think if you're on team normal saline, I don't think you're saving people. Um, but it really depends on how you're approaching this problem from, and how you're interpreting data in a Bayesian versus a frequentist statistical approach. So you're both right, congratulations. Um, I'm using lactated ringers for everyone, except for my traumatic brain injured folks. That is a very clear winner for our normal saline, right? Anyone who works in the NICU, they do not use balanced solutions and the basis drives the trial. So that was for all comers to the paper. The, now we have some niche papers on specific pathologies that we see very commonly in the emergency department and ICU. So normal saline versus, this is plasma light in um, severe DKA. These folks were sick, that pH of 6.9, that, that might get me out, out of my chair as a attending. Um, they both got a ton of fluids, about seven liters, that's a bunch. And then the insulin was about um, the same. So same, same, pretty internally robust study looking at it. Their primary outcome was speed of DKA resolution, which they used as um, getting their base access um, over three. And there are two different kinds of these. Their primary outcome is actually that first box, which is at 48 hours. I don't believe that's a um, time frame in the emergency department that I care about, 48 hours for a long time. But 24 hours with our boarding, if I can get somebody out of DKA, that really does impact my disposition, where they can go in my hospital. I don't know about you, but they can go to the floor if they're not on insulin just like me. And so they had a four time more likelihood of actually having resolution of their acid glycolytic if you used um, a lactated ringers or a plasma light versus normal saline. So please consider that. It's going to speed the resolution and you may be able to move them through their hospital stay 
at a, um, at a quicker pace than you otherwise would be used to. Not to harp on saving again, but it also shouldn't be used unless you're on paper. Um, this is an RCT looking at 5% albumin versus normal saline in folks with septic shock that were known to us. Sick folks. They're maps here in the 50s. So that's a number that, even as an intensive care physician, I'm like, ah, that's probably pretty low. We should be thinking about that. Um, lactate, about seven. And then their mouth score, um, just to um, use this as a barometer of how sick they are, I'd say 80% mortality at 30 days without transplant in a normal saline approach. So these are sick humans. In this primary outcome, they were looking at, can we reverse shock um, with our initial resuscitation tool? And when they gave boluses at 5% albumin versus normal saline, their shock reduction at three hours was almost four times that. So very quickly, we went through a variety of um, discussion on how to address hypoxemia in the phase group. Probably for all comers, lactate urine is probably a little bit better than normal saline, but you can be totally defended in back of home literature if you're using that. However, when it comes to some specific niche population, DKA, severe DKA, and cirrhotic with sepsis, use lactate urine and um, albumin for sepsis. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, um, so he got fluids. I get blood, okay? <laughs> this is the exciting thing. So let's talk hemorrhage, right? And let's talk a little bit. This year was not an exciting year for blood product resuscitation, I would say. Uh, so uh, we, we delved pretty deep. I would be shocked if any of you are reading the World Journal of, uh, of uh, Surgery, but we did. Uh, and we figured uh, yeah. um, that it's, you know, this is the time to talk no trauma, no drama. And so we're going to talk about Ballman's World Journal of Surgery paper, which was a randomized control trial looking at pigtail versus large bore chest tube in hemothorax, okay? We know if it's just air, that little one is better, right? It's much more comfortable for the patient. But you probably all work with trauma surgeons who say, oh, but there's gonna be an ounce of blood in there, I need to suck it out with a large bore chest tube, right? And so what we wanted, this was a randomized control trial, single center in an American uh, uh, ICU and, and ED. And what they were looking at was failure rate of the chest tube. Only about 20 people in each arm, okay, aiming for 75 in each arm. They stopped it early because they met the metrics that they needed to meet, which was a non-inferiority RCT, excluding emergent chest tubes. Sorry, I'll get there, I'll get there, but, oh well, we'll take it home, promise. Uh, but at the end of the day, what they were looking at was failure rate of their pigtail versus their large bore chest tubes. And there was no difference in their groups on pretty much any metric. And they defined failure as a variety of things, including need for a second tube, uh, retained hemothorax, or need for VATS. Okay, so pretty significant things that you actually care about. And what you'll see in sort of the pigtail catheter arm is not a single metric is inferior, if not you know, reaching towards the more positive side. The one downside is the pigtails on average were put in on day two, and the large bore chest tubes were put in on day one. So again, hard to maybe decide that this is worth you implementing in the emergency department. But I will say, one of the things they also looked at, surgeons actually asking how the patient feels. Weird, right? But Not just if they poop that day, yeah. how they actually feel. They actually asked how they feel. And so their metric was from a one of, I'd get a chest tube again, that's actually what their one score was, to five, which is never again would I receive a chest tube. Patients that received pigtail catheters on average said, I'd do that again, sure. <laughs> that's, that was the metric, that 23 of them, median score was one. Okay, the median score in the chest tube group, and this is fully anesthetized non-emergent, said a three, which was, that was a bad experience. That was their like tagline, okay? So, patient-centeredness says, if it doesn't change the outcome, don't put our patients through it. I don't know how many of you do it, but I always use a touch of Versed in my chest tubes for this very reason, because I was assuming that this is the case. Now we have at least randomized control data saying there's no difference between a drinking straw versus a garden hose, okay? And so I am much more apt to see, you know, putting in pigtails, advocating for putting in pigtails, even in the emergency department. 
okay? I think this study is not done. We need to do it in an emergent setting, obviously. But if they are stable, and you don't think it's a massive hemothorax, it's worth at least having the discussion with your trauma surgeon in today's world. Because quite honestly, the pigtail put out more, actually if you look at the groups, the pigtail put out more uh, volume over the course of their 48 to 72 hours in than the large bore chest tube. So even the assumption that you can't get anything out is an over assumption. So not saying I'm going exclusively to pigtails by any means, <laughs> because in the trauma bay itself, we still may need that, there still may be some role in the emergent patient. But realistically, these pigtails are getting easier and easier and better and better. And the data for them is getting out there. So discuss it with your trauma surgeons. Now, no more trauma, no more drama, right? But we gotta keep moving. So this is actually out of ED-based group. Uh, Frank Guyette is out of the University of Pittsburgh. It published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery this year was a small uh, feasibility randomized control trial of whole blood versus PRBCs in the pre-hospital setting. So yes, even critical care is getting out in the pre-hospital setting these days. And so what they looked at was about 40 patients in each arm, randomized control of adults who uh, uh, had some sort of need for blood product resuscitation as you know, evidenced by shock index versus uh, severe low blood pressure below a map, or excuse me, a, 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 a SVP of less than 70. What they were looking at was feasibility. Yes, we can put whole blood on helicopters, just like we put PRBCs on helicopters and be successful with it. And what they showed was there was a non-inferiority. It looks impressive, but again, if you, oh, sorry. If you look at the actual, you know, graph, it's not really different in any mortality point throughout the course of a 28 day. Their, their primary outcome was 28 day mortality, no difference there, no difference in the one day mortality that we would expect to see if you're, massive, if you're concerned about empirically giving significant blood products. So I guess my take home point to this one is how many of y'all are moving towards whole blood product resuscitation? There's well, I see you in a uniform, sir. Yes, sir, that makes sense. Which, uh, yes, sir. Uh, the, no question the military's moving in this direction. There is ample data to say in the civilian population this is better. Why? Because there's no question that blood product compo component therapy is challenging to manage, right? And if you look at all the secondary analyses, and again, this is just a feasibility trial to prove that it's worth doing a full-on RCT, but I don't doubt that this group's gonna be looking at this in the near future in a pre-hospital setting. And all of the metrics, from total amount of RBCs transfused to total amount of any product transfused, was significantly <coughs> lower. In or was, excuse me, that was an overestimate. Was close to significant in the 2020. Uh, 20 people, or few, 40 and 40. It's not exactly hard to reach statistical significance, but uh, there were some pretty s stellar outcomes from this feasibility trial. So I think it's time. You should probably, if you're not using it in your ED, start talking to people because. While this is not a change you're gonna make overnight, and it's not something you can unilaterally change in the ED, it's important for us to start advocating for our patients. My blood banking colleagues somewhere in the world right now are you know, like smacking their heads on the table, but realistically, this is probably the right place, and we unquestionably will be back in a couple of years talking about the other trials that say we should be going to this in the ED. So with just the five or so minutes left, here is the QR code. If you want to read any of these papers, feel free. You can go to the Google Drive. Or if you want to read all of them, because there's such great comments below, you might as well read it too. Uh, feel free, and we'll take any questions you have.